So just take a look around you and think about your year group and ask yourself the question, who do you think is going to be most successful in the next 15 years? Right? Think about that. Who's going to be most successful in the next 15 years? Now, don't give us any names, but just shout out why you think those people are going to be successful. This is the interactive bit. Sorry? Work hard. Keep coming, keep coming. You must know some successful people, potentially. Determination, yeah? Ambition. Ambition. Motivation, sorry? Yes, exam grades, absolutely. More, more, keep coming. Resilience. Personality. Personality, personality, exactly. So now, it's interesting actually, normally when you do that, if I do this to a corporate audience, you'll generally find that there are about 10 to 15 responses before anybody talks about an attitude. With you guys, the first five were all attitudinal and someone finally said exam grades. Now, how many of you spend much of your time, effort, and energy at school focusing on how well you're going to do in your exams? Hands up, right? How many of your parents tell you that the future is based on your exam success? Yeah, absolutely. Right, so common sense tells us that we know that our kind of attitudes and the way we show up in life matters, but most of our energy and effort and the way in which we define ourselves is based on our kind of external success. Now, 12 years ago, we set up a global coaching business where what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out why some people seem to be successful in the toughest times in their life and others kind of failed, right? What was the difference between those who were able to step up and succeed and those who basically were kind of undermined by the tough times in life? Um, we expected it to be largely based on a kind of combination of kind of smarts, IQ, intelligence, experience, and attitude. Now, interestingly, 35,000 coaches later and the world's biggest database on what it is that drives success, we find that it is squarely about attitude. Attitude trumps intelligence by nearly three and a half times. You are significantly more likely to be successful in life if you develop the right attitude. Sounds simple. And in many ways, it is. So we've distilled this kind of research into we think there are kind of 38 attitudes that really count the most. But there are three in particular that relatively early on in your life and career, if you can develop these and grow them, you lay the foundations for future success. It's kind of essentially we've got 35,000 people to prove it, and we kind of know this as a simple truth. So kind of attitude number one, very simple, give it a go even if you don't know. Now, I don't know if for many of you, you will have spent time around successful people who are kind of largely admired because they're great at their exams, they're fantastic on the sports field, they play musical instruments, they never seem to put a, a kind of step wrong in life. Now, very interestingly, the younger you are in your success, the less likely you are to step off that particular beaten track. So the better you are, the earlier you are in life, the less likely you are to take risks because your self-esteem is intimately defined by being brilliant. Everybody knows you for being brilliant and you're rewarded for it. And your likelihood of you stepping off that path is significantly reduced. Now there's an American professor called uh, Carol Dweck. Many of you will have heard of her, her kind of fixed and growth mindset study. If you haven't, fascinating stuff. You must look at it. She, got, um, <laughs> she put 400 students, 10, 11 year old, across America and she put them into two groups. She gave them all a very simple IQ test, 10 questions, which essentially everyone was going to get between 8 and 10 out of 10 right. Um, what they then did is they simply, they provided two different types of feedback. The first group were basically told that they did really well and therefore they must be very smart. This was a demonstration of their intelligence and how good they were. For the second group, with the same results, all they did was tell them that they must be people who put it in. Effort, reward, you work on the process. That was the kind of emphasis of the whole agenda for them. Now, surprisingly, what happened next, when they looked at those two groups, they basically said, well, you've got the opportunity to take a maths test, an easy maths test or a hard maths test. The group who'd basically been praised for being smart, 33% of them took the tough math, math test. 
The group that had been praised for putting effort in, 92% of them took the, the tough maths test. They then gave them a maths test that none of them could do. It was designed to be impossible for 10 and 11 year olds. Interestingly, the people who had been praised for being smart spent nearly half as long doing the test, got frustrated and gave up, whereas the people who had been praised simply, this is all just about simple praise, for putting effort in, spent twice as long on the test and were much more prone to enjoy it. Interestingly, when they then gave them the IQ test at the end of the session, again, they did a kind of another 10-point simple question. There was a 20% reduction in performance for those people who, based on their, their success, was based on their ability to do well. There was a 30% uplift for those who essentially believe that effort was what mattered. Now, so for us, in our experience kind of working with executives, it appears that those people who have defined their early career on being good at stuff are much, much, much less likely to kind of step out into the unknown. And therefore, their propensity to learn from their, their experience is significantly reduced. I mean, if, you kind of, if you're prepared to give a thing a go when you don't know, your relationship to kind of risk and failure changes dramatically. And what happens, you kind of, this sort of growth and fixed mindset that Dweck talks about, I mean, it, it, it means that your preparedness to actually learn from the mistakes in life, not be defined by them, your capacity to make new sense of new situations is enhanced massively, and probably most importantly, your courage is kind of triggered. So interestingly, I mean, for me, I spent most of my early life as a relative failure in the eyes of both my kind of teachers, myself, and many of my, my colleagues and peers. However, the great advantage of that is I didn't grow up with a belief that if I tried something and failed, it would necessarily define me. So I was much, much more likely to kind of give it a go and see what happened. Now, the irony is, once you start to do that, that kind of clicks in your capacity to learn at nearly three times the rate of people who are brilliant early in life. Second attitude, intimately linked to this, the ability to kind of burst your own bubble. We talk about the idea that for many of us, we kind of, we grow up in an environment where we're surrounded by relatively like-minded people. Most of our friends tend to think and act in a relatively similar way. And just basically the whole question of psychological safety, we like to be with people who think like we do. Um, the trouble with this, of course, is that we are very unlikely to step off our own beaten track. Right, unless either society forces us or we have lots of kind of good opportunities. Um, I mean, a uh, fascinating time in my life when I went um, out to Kashmir and worked with a group of young, 35 young people who were all in danger of becoming radicalized. So in Kashmir, kind of northern India, it's been a troubled land for many years since partition. There's a kind of a, a strong kind of Islamic community who've been at odds with the kind of Hindu uh, brothers and sisters, and just over the border in Pakistan, there are three jihadi schools within 25 miles of this particular part of Kashmir. Um, what we did with these young people, and uh, interestingly, of the 35, there were 16 women in the group, and 12 of them have, had suffered sexual violence at the hands of the Indian Army. Of the 35, 34 of them had, had either a member of the family killed or abducted by the Indian Army, and therefore hatred was very much alive and well in that group and they were all considering becoming jihadis or suicide bombers in the next 12 months. Right, so those are the criteria upon which they got involved in this work. All we did is we basically, for five days, for the first two days, we got them speaking to people that they'd never met before. We had them meeting uh, generals from the Indian Army, we had them meeting politicians from the kind of other side of the divide. Um, we had them, uh, fascinatingly, we got them to talk to some people who'd been involved in the peace process in Northern Ireland, and had actually just built kind of communities of practice and, and uh, had got the Protestants and Catholics to kind of spend real time together healing their communities and not relying on their politicians. So all of this was fascinating, but the thing that made the biggest difference was when we taught these people to understand how they were thinking. So their reaction to all of these stimuli. And what they realized is that their kind of worldview, the kind of strength of their beliefs and their thoughts at the moment, took them down a cul-de-sac of hatred, distortion, and exaggeration. So we just literally had them understand how their minds would distort any input they were given, no matter how positive, and take them back to the same place. 
So over the course of this week, they started to realize that the problem wasn't the situation they're in, the problem was the way that they were reacting to it. And for me, kind of one of the most powerful things I've ever been involved in was when we were checking out at the end of this week, having the majority of them saying that they're prepared to put aside the suicide bomb and choose to be community builders in their, in their village because that was all that was left for them. So for us, if you kind of step off your beaten track, you kind of learn how to notice your own worldview, you will unlock a combination of your inquisitiveness, your capacity to kind of have a sense of what's possible, and crucially, the ability to what we call kind of cr critically reflect. How do you realize that your mind is actually your friend rather than your enemy and not just be trapped by the bubble that you live in? So if you do that, the kind of third area for us is it, you're much, much more likely to end up leading a life where you are naturally attracted to the things that feel most meaningful. So many of you will have been told about the importance of kind of following your passions or leading a purposeful life. Our experience is that if you're able to kind of give it a go, even when you don't know, if you're able to kind of burst your own bubble, meaning will find you. Right? So we've been in situations where organizations that are kind of part of the big food and drink manufacturers, the pharmaceutical businesses, the banks, the leaders that basically get involved in changing those organizations, trying to shake them up, wake them up, and make forces for social good, are the people that demonstrate those two attitudes. Because they're naturally drawn like a kind of moth to the things that matter and that are meaningful. They're much more naturally courageous. They find the temple radical in them, and their creativity is a source of joy for them rather than something that they go in search of. So for you, the kind of irony here is, if you're not careful, you will have been sold the story that it's important to be brilliant. Go find those things that you're great at and stick with them. The truth is, if you stick with what you're brilliant at, you will not necessarily develop that mindset that enables you to unlock the potential you're yet to discover. So get interested in what you're not, rather than focus on what you're brilliant at. You take that with you no matter where you go. If you can develop a mindset, that enables you to kind of unlock your inquisitiveness and find your courage, that's when you start to shape the world that you're a part of. Thank you.